So we're continuing the series we commenced last Lord's Day on biblical evangelism. Biblical evangelism. And the first lesson, our focus was on what evangelism is not and is. And if you recall, we um, highlighted some things that would not constitute evangelism, things that you find commonly practiced amongst some. We said that evangelism is not an imposition of our beliefs on others. It is not sharing our personal testimony. It is good to share our personal testimonies of conversion. It is not the same thing as social action or political involvement. We said it is not encouraging positive thinking. We also said that it's not the same as apologetics. There is a place for apologetics. We said it is not showing. Um, by that we meant that it's not something we display apart from the proclaimed word. Folks who or advocate for what is called friendship evangelism where you have to make friends with the person before you can share the gospel with them. Or the folks who say that we are to live out the gospel. And we understand what is meant by that. We understand that we are to be fruit bearers. The Bible calls us salt and light. We are to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And even in First Peter chapter 3, you back up there where Peter is admonishing wives and exhorting wives married to men who are disobedient to the word. He says to the wives there, win him without the word. So we understand that. But we said that's not evangelism. And then evangelism is also not to be confused with the results of evangelism. It is expected that in our carrying out that enterprise, in our seeking to fulfill uh, the commission that the Lord has given to us, that we are desirous that people will be saved. We looked at Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 10, and Paul clearly shows a man who is agonized, who, who is in agony, sorry, for um, the Jews, those his kinsmen according to the flesh. But the outcome of evangelism is not the same as evangelism. It simply is the outcome of evangelism. Okay? And so we see we, the, 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 the point we made, and you recall it obviously generated some conversation, is that we do not, if we conflate the two, then there's a tendency for us to be pragmatic, where by all means necessary we say we want to save the lost. And then we go back to the first point where we're imposing our beliefs on others or where we are insisting that people come out in the name of what is called altar call, make a profession right there after we have proclaimed the gospel to them because we are result-oriented. We should desire a result. We should desire that the Lord will save. But ours is to proclaim the Lord is the one who regenerates. And that's the point that we made it there. Now, what evangelism is, is simply getting the word of God, the gospel, to the people who need to hear it. Preaching the gospel for the sake of God's glory. It is setting forth the good news, revealing the saving mercies of God in the Lord Jesus Christ to the lost. So evangelism is like a vehicle that is carrying this good news. There is the news but that news must be disseminated. It must be told. It must be proclaimed in the hearing of those who are lost. So that is evangelism. And we said that it is an act of obedience. So where we are not evangelizing, then we are sinning against the Lord. We are disobeying his command. Evangelism is not optional for the church. It's not optional for the saints. It's certainly not optional in the pulpit ministry. Evangelism is part and parcel of the life of a local church. It is the responsibility of every believer to proclaim the gospel. So this morning we want to turn our focus to the message of evangelism. That was simply a recap of what we considered last week. And so in the second lesson, we want to look at the message of evangelism. What exactly are we to proclaim what is the gospel? Those are the questions that we 
are hoping to ask and answer. Because if we proclaim anything else, then it's not evangelism. We may proclaim, we may preach, we may speak, we may declare, we may write, but if it is not the gospel, it is not evangelism. They are heralds representing different religions and different deities. Mormons show up at your door with their white shirts, nicely ironed black ties, and their black name tags, and they believe themselves to be evangelizing. The Jehovah Witnesses, likewise, when they stay at the street corners with their Watchtower magazines, and they are seeking to engage in some conversation or the other, they do not have the gospel. It's not evangelism. If it's not the gospel that is being proclaimed, and then it's something else. It's a speech, it's just a talk. It is not evangelism biblically defined. Now this gospel is found only in Holy Scripture. And this point is underscored in our confession of faith. And I want to turn to chapter 20 of our confession of faith. I know you don't have copies, so you'd have to pay attention as I read um, chapter 20 of the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, that where the gospel is revealed. So I want to read the first two paragraphs. And it reads, Because the covenant of works was broken by sin and unable to confer life, God was pleased to proclaim the promise of Christ, the seed of the woman, as the means of calling the elect and producing in them faith and repentance. Let me take that again. Because the covenant of works, covenant of works is dealt with in chapter 7 of the Confession of Faith. Because the covenant of works was broken by sin, Adam's sin, Genesis 3, verse 15. Um, so Genesis 3, 15 is the proto-evangelion, but back up, you remember the fall um, when Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord. So because the covenant of works was broken, by sin, that covenant was unable, it became incapable of conferring life. You recall that God said, do this and leave. But it broke it, so he couldn't confer life. God was pleased to proclaim the promise of Christ, which is what we find in Genesis 3, verse 15. The seed of the woman as the means of calling the elect and producing in them faith and repentance. And it says, in this promise, the gospel in its substance was revealed and made effectual for the conversion and salvation of sinners. In this promise, that promise in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman crushing the head of the seed of the serpent, in its substance, the gospel in its substance was revealed. And then made effectual for the conversion and salvation of sinners. So, essentially, it's saying that we have the evangelism in promised form there in Genesis 3, 15. And then you go on to the um, second paragraph. But just to make the point, again, especially concerning the last part of that paragraph, where it says, made effectual for the conversion and salvation of sinners. So the intended end for which the gospel was given, for which this promise was given, it will be met. That is, sinners will truly be converted. So God has ordained the means by which sinners will be converted. That is the point of the promise. And it's indicating to us that the message of the gospel is sufficient for the conversion of the lost. The message of the gospel is sufficient for the conversion of the lost. And its success does not rest on those who are proclaiming the gospel, but the one who has ordained it, the one who has made the promise, and who keeps his word. It rests entirely on God. And so we can even apply here that the success of the gospel does not require us to supplement it with human methodologies. There's nothing wrong with methodologies. We'll look, get to the methodology of evangelism to the extent that it is biblical. But you get what I mean by human methodologies. When we're trying to bring in our own ideas as to how we think this gospel may be proclaimed. 
So because if it's not resting on us, then what's the point of adding, padding, taking away from the gospel? Then the second paragraph reads, This promise of Christ and of salvation through him is revealed in the word of God alone. That's an important point. It is revealed in the word of God alone. The works of creation and providence, when assisted only by the light of nature, do not reveal Christ or grace through him, even in a general or obscure way, much less are those without the revelation of him in the promise or gospel enabled to attain saving faith or repentance by seeking these works of God. What are the framers of the confession saying? God has revealed his promise of Christ only in his word. So you see the contrast between natural revelation? You go back there, it says, the works of creation and providence, when assisted only by the light of nature, do not reveal Christ or grace through him, even in a general or obscure way. So this promise that God has made, the promise concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, is only revealed in the word of God. And what does that tell us? That no one can be saved apart from the gospel. No one can be saved uh, apart from the proclamation of the gospel. In Romans 10, 14 and 15, the apostle writes, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news or good things. And you go down to verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing. Not hearing anything, but hearing the word of Christ. So this, let me just, I still want to touch on this point because it's an important point that we find here. Um, in Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul says that he's not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. In the gospel, these things are revealed, which is what he goes on to say in verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous or the just shall live by faith. So it is not revealed in the other spheres of revelation, or the other sphere of revelation, what we call general revelation. That's not where it's revealed. Creation is the Lord's. Providence is the Lord. The light of nature, it is all from God. But Christ is not revealed in that theater, it's not revealed in natural or general re revelation. If somebody stands and stares at the skies from now to tomorrow, he will not know Christ. He will not know Christ. He should declare that God is good and God is glorious because the heavens declare the glory of God. He looks at the firmament. He looks at himself. He's fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, there should be a, 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 that in it response yeah, that there is God. Uh, so, uh, that a divine being made me and made all these things. But he cannot see Christ. You can stand now uh, at just the beauty of creation and look through a telescope and, and marvel at the vastness of, of God's handiwork. But you will not see Christ. That's the point being made. It is in the gospel. It is in the gospel that Christ is revealed. In the opening paragraph of our confession, chapter 1, paragraph 1, it says, The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable. Romans 1, 18 and following. 
yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and his will which is necessary unto salvation. What did Paul say to Timothy? You know, the, they have known the secret writings from your infancy. It is in scripture. So God indeed reveals his goodness in creation, in providence. But it is only in scripture. And that's why the conversion says the only sufficient, certain, which means sure, an infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience is the Holy Scripture. And this is where the gospel is revealed. The gospel is not revealed in dreams. It's not revealed in visions. It's not revealed in any of these other things. Christ is revealed in the gospel as we find it in Scripture. And the implication is clear. We should know it that we might proclaim it. So I've just said that as a foundation uh, as we go into answering the question, what is the gospel message? What is the gospel message? We said that the message, of, where, where, the message of evangelism is the gospel. What then is the gospel message? Obviously, the gospel means good news or glad tidings. First of all, the gospel is a message about God. It is a message about God. It is God's message. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. It's a message about God because it is God's gospel. He came preaching the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You see that? He came preaching the gospel of God. He came preaching God's message. And God's message is principally about him, God's good news. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ came preaching. If people are going to repent and believe in the good news, then they must know the one whose good news it is. And that is God. Romans 1 verse 1, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Set apart to minister, to proclaim, to set forth the gospel of God. God's gospel. The gospel is a message about God. But what specifically about God? And obviously we're treating this um, not... Uh, well, I say comprehensively, but we'll touch on some aspect. First of all, it tells us that God is the source of all life. The source of all life. And the extent, and just to practicalize this, the extent of um, what we say when we evangelize will vary from person to person. It's not that we have different messages. Do not get me wrong. It is that one gospel. But the degree to which we will elaborate on some things in this, particular con in this particular situation, elaborate on the person, the identity of God, will, de will depend on who we are interacting. If you look at, uh, well, I think we can demonstrate this in the book of Acts. So we'll look at some passages in Acts, and you would see the difference in how Paul ministered to the Jews on the one hand, and then to the Gentiles on the other. In Acts 13, verse 16, Acts 13, verse 16, and following. So this is Paul's first missionary journey. The, pro the proconsul has been converted and Paul makes his way to Perga in Pamphylia. We read in verse 16, Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of these people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put, them, he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed the land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. There's a clear presumption that they know who God is here because of the, the particular audience. He's speaking to Jews. He doesn't get into the fact that God made them. It's right there. It says, 
men of Israel and you who fear God. You who fear God will refer to the proselyte. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it doesn't say more than that. The God of these people, Israel, chose our fathers. So there's something mutual that is shared, the fact that they have the same Jewish heritage. And it just goes on there. And so, in a sense, when you are speaking to those who are within the church, because not all who claim to be Christians are Christians, or not all who attend church services are Christians, there is often time, um, well, that would vary from place to place, obviously, but you are not getting into an expansive detail on some aspects about who God is. Because these are things that a common knowledge would say. A common knowledge. People have gone through Sunday school, so they know that God created all things. And they don't deny that. And so we go ahead and we proclaim the gospel to them. But there's a marked difference when you now turn to Acts 14 and, and verse 15. Let me read from verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, saying, into the crowd crying out, and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you, and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. Now, these were pagan worshippers. They were about to deify um, Paul and Barnabas, if you back up to verse 12, you read there that, and they began calling Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Because they had seen the miracle that they had performed. So these are pagans. They don't have the background that the Jews had. And what did they tell them? First of all, we are also men of the same nature as you. We're like you in every way. And preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things, these pagan deities, to a living God. The implication, obviously, that their gods are dead. They do not live. Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. So it's the sort of way you would evangelize if you are in some village where perhaps they've never heard the gospel or to pagans, or perhaps agnostics and atheists, you would get into God as the source of life. There will be that detailed explanation, of course, depending on the, the time that you have. And we see this repeated in Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. It's a popular account. It's Paul at the Areopagos or Mars Hill. He sees the inscription to an unknown God, and he says to them at the end of verse 23, Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it. People who are confused about God, people who have, have no sense of what is called theistic religion. Muslims would, would agree that... that God made the heavens and the earth. And so it's regarded as a theistic religion. But you have all sorts of other religions where it's an entirely different concept. And so it says, the God who made the heaven, the heavens, uh, who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hand. And in all situations, um, chapter 14 and this situation, the emphasis is the only true and living God. Not different gods making the world. Because even, about, even if, you, if you consider Yoruba deities, for example, Ifa has made this one. Abi, um, what are the other ones? Shango is, has done this one. Of course, there is like you have your supreme council. So there's God, and then this is vice regents. You know, Ifa is for, if I, is it the earth? Shango is thunder. So you have all of these things. You know, so if, you're in, if, you, if you go to that community, what are you saying? You are going back to the fact, you must start with the fact that God, the God of Scripture, who is revealed in Scripture, is the source of all life. You can't presume, you can't assume, you can't dismiss that. So when we say that the message, the, the gospel is a message about God, 
we, are, we have to have as our starting point, uh, depending obviously on who we're preaching to, but to a degree to all who we're preaching to, that he is the source of all life. Uh, the second thing that we, that the, we should know about God is th that he is holy. Uh, the message of the gospel about God is that God is holy. The gospel is a message about the holiness of God. Habakkuk 1 verse 13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Isaiah 59 verse 2, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That must be clearly explained. The holiness of God. The perfections of God must be declared. The gospel is a message about the holiness of God. The God who abhors sin. The one who is angry with the wicked every day. The thrice holy God. Of purer eyes, I will not look on wickedness with favor. And then the message of the gospel is a message about the justice of God. About the justice of God. Psalm 11 verse 7, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. The Lord is righteous. It speaks about rightness. Perfect righteousness. He's righteous. He loves righteousness. And he made men upright, didn't he? Because he's upright. The upright will behold his face, we are told. Isaiah 5, verse 16, But the Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment, and the Holy God will show himself holy in righteousness. Psalm 7, verse 11, God is a righteous judge, and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword, he has bent his bow and made it ready. This is the just judge of all the earth who does right. You recall the conversation that he had with Abraham. He is just. He is righteous. He does not approve of sin. Is this the God you present when you proclaim the gospel? Because we must start with who God is. We, we, we're not self-existent. We exist. And that fact alone tells us how we must carry out this conversation when we proclaim the gospel. It is the gospel of God that the Lord Jesus Christ came proclaiming. This is the backdrop against which we judge all things. This is the backdrop. And we can touch on all the other many attributes of God. But this must be highlighted. The message of the gospel is about the holiness of God, about the justice of God, indeed about God in full. Second, it is a message about sin. And I'll only touch on this briefly and elaborate on it more next time so that we can ask questions. I want to read something from the, um, I think it was the 2022 Ligonier State of Theology Report. And in that survey that was carried out regarding the nature of man, a man sinful by nature, the outcome of, the, of that survey is that, this is obviously in the US, 57 percent agreed to the statement that everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Now, if you are in that camp and is that your premise, what are you going to say about sin? I've said that the message of the gospel is a message about sin. It's a message about God. It's a message about sin. But if you believe that everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature, you have a problem, don't you? Uh, you have a big problem. 
Because in other words, you're saying that human beings are, are capable or might be capable of committing individual sins, but we do not have sinful natures. It runs against the idea clearly um, established in scripture of original sin. So what is called Pelagianism. That's the historical theological name for this doctrine. The men are born sinless. Romans 5 verse 12, that is obviously not the case. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. All, Romans 3 verse 23, have sinned. And they fall short of the glory of God. And when David acknowledged that he was conceived in sin, he wasn't speaking about himself only. He was speaking about all men. Our conception was in sin. We are sinners by nature. And we express that nature in sinful actions. Somebody called it a bad record and a bad heart. Because we have bad hearts, we have bad records. We do bad things. We do evil things because of our nature. So the message of the gospel is a message about the sinfulness of man. The fact that we are fallen in sin. Now, as we teach our children, when we catechize them, that instead of being holy and happy, what happened to Adam when they had sinned? They became sinful and miserable. They fell short of the glory of God. Men, God made men upright, but then they devised strange things. So the condition of man must be fully established. Uh, we must not treat it as uh, just a mere symptom or just something small. The picture that we have in Isaiah 1 must be fully presented. That from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, he is corrupt through and through. Yes, the expression varies from person to person. But man is estranged from God because he is dead in sins and trespasses. He's a child of wrath. He's a son of disobedience. All the adjectives that are used must be there. And this is the age where our sensibilities are heightened. And so we do not want to cause an offense. But sin is an offense against God. Sin is an offense against God. That ought to be our concern. And so in when we evangelize, we are making sure that we bring that to bear on those that we are speaking to. That you have offended the thrice holy God. Your concern is with him. That is the testimony of scripture regarding us. And we can elaborate on this. What is 9.35? Now let me pause um, for some questions if there, there are. First of all, just a recap. We're looking at the message of evangelism, right? We've already established that when you open your mouth to evangelize, when you're seeking to be faithful in carrying out this exercise, the message matters. It's not your message. It is God's message. It's called the gospel of God. It's not called the gospel of man. So there's no gospel for the African American. There's no gospel for the Nigerian. There's no health and wealth gospel. There's, all those gospels are not the gospel. If that's the gospel you're proclaiming, you're not evangelizing. You're not evangelizing. If the gospel has to change on the basis of where you are, you're not evangelizing. The Indian is as corrupt as the Nigerian. The American is as corrupt as the Russian. But if you, if, if, you, if you have a contextual gospel, you don't have the gospel. The gospel is the gospel. It is God's gospel. It is God's message. And then this message is found in scripture. God has disclosed many aspects of his person in nature. But he has not disclosed this promise of his son in the gospel, in nature. You must come to the word of God. That was the point of going through those two paragraphs in the confession of faith. And then looking at the gospel itself, we said that it is good news and it's a message about God and concerning God, the fact that God is the source of all life. And looking at the passages that we cited, well, you didn't just drop from the sky. And let people be atheists, let people reject, as is to proclaim that message. 
And also highlighting the fact that it's a message about the holiness of God. The perfections of God. The justice of God. Obviously the love of God and all his divine attributes. It's a message about who God is. And it's a message about sin. And the Bible des describes sin in stark terms. So that we may despair of ourselves. Because when God is presented as this resplendent being, before whose presence we cannot stand, if we do not see ourselves as like the blackness of night, uh, then we will not see our need for Christ. Because based on that survey, if we just sin a little and we are good by nature, then you know the consequences of that. There's no point in the good news. What is good about the news? if you are good by nature. There's, there's no point for it. You, 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 you're all sorted. You have it all figured out. You can just waltz your way into the throne of grace and commune with God because you're good. But that's not the case. That's not the case. We are wretched by nature and we need to be reconciled to God. All right, are there any questions? Yes. Raise your hand. Okay, good morning, sir. Morning. Yes, yeah, so you said, so the main fact that the message of the gospel is only revealed in the word of God, shouldn't that mean that in witnessing to you know many people these days who are atheists or agnostics or even believers in other religion that have some other um, um, scriptures shouldn't that mean that establishing the authority of scripture should also in some sense be paramount in witnessing to them and i'm saying this against a backdrop of what you said last week you know that um, apologetics is not evangelism, but in evangelizing, you know, to people who I just, um, th these categories of people who I just mentioned, you know, most of them would ask questions like, so why are you quoting from the Bible to establish this message that you're telling me about? Yeah. So to what extent should one go in establishing the authority of scriptures in doing that? So, um, We'll come to apologetics and the gospel. Um, I didn't say that apologetics does not have any place in the gospel enterprise or evangelistic enterprise. I said apologetics itself is not evangelism. That was the point I was making. So when you, you can defend or present or seek to make a case for the inerrancy, the infallibility, and the authority of scripture, but that in itself is not evangelism. You still have to proclaim the gospel to the lost person. Do you understand? So in the course of evangelizing, if somebody asks you why you think, why you, a Muslim would ask you why you think that you, this is authoritative over and against my own religious book, you will tell them why this is authoritative. Obviously, of course, you do that. So we're not saying that you will not do that. Well, you can do that without preaching the gospel. You can. And that's what we're saying, that when you do that and you do not preach the gospel, then you haven't evangelized. Do you understand? Yeah. So there, are, there will always be cases to give a defense for the hope. And when we are dealing with these persons, I mean, you talk about creation. The atheist is rolling his eyes because he believes that the earth is 7 billion years and the Big Bang and so on and so forth. You can only make a case, right? You can show, and we'll see this later on this morning in the sermon, that scripture it bears witness to itself as the word of God. But then, what is the power of God to save? The gospel. You understand? The power of God to save is the gospel. We're not the, we're not the, we're not the ones who convict hearts. The Lord has given us a message to save. The Lord knows that there are a variety of people who must be addressed 
in different sort of ways, which is why I cited the example of the Jews presents um, the picture of the, the guy who has grown up in church but who hasn't believed, right? So he knows the gospel. He has been in Sunday school classes. He's been in church. So he's really not saying that those things are wrong, but he's not saved. So how do you preach the gospel to them? And so the degree to which you will now go into that will sort of vary from the person who has no concept whatsoever of the Bible. So there is a place to do that, but that in itself is not evangelism. You look confused. Or something. Are you Ezekiel? <laughs> the way you're looking. <laughs> yes, okay, for you. Good morning, Pastor. Good yeah, morning. I, I want you to comment on what, what I'm thinking through. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking, uh, I'm looking at Christ as the perfect evangelist and perhaps also the most successful evangelist and then also the perfect communicator of the gospel message. So can I just quickly read three yeah, sure. verses? Okay, so um, the first is Matthew 4, 17. Um, you, you had already read Mark 1, which, but this also tallies. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then Acts 1 verse, verse 3, to them he, present, he that Jesus Christ, presen presented himself alive after his suffering by, by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Then Acts 1. Ha Sorry? Acts 1 what? Acts 1 verse 3. Okay. So you don't need to read and it. then the last is um, Acts 23, 28, the last verse, verse 30, verse 30 and 31. He, Excuse me. he, that is Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Mm. So um, f from, from the verse you quoted in Mark, and then also from what I, I read, and then if you check through throughout the gospel, you see that Jesus Christ launched his public ministry with that message saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, so the first thing I, I want you to comment on is um, regard to strategies, right? Uh, when, when he said those words, what did his hearers hear? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then, secondly, I, I don't think I've ever met anybody in our time or in recent history who say those words to in, in evangelism, right? Um, I come to you and say, hey, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, something like that. I want you to comment on that as well. And then you also see that at the end of his ministry, Jesus Christ spent 40 days explaining the idea of the kingdom of God. Yeah. So. And then the middle as well, you see, is, is, it seems as though this phenomenon of the kingdom of God um, is so very, was, was, was his greatest burden and passion, right? And then we now see Paul's life as well. This is the end of his own ministry and his life. He spent two whole years proclaiming the things about the kingdom of God. So the third question would be the idea or the, this great phenomenon of the kingdom of God that both um, Jesus Christ was obsessed with, and then we seem as though Paul also was, was obsessed with. Uh, is it right for, for us to use that as a framework in thinking about the gospel message and then in proclaiming it as well? Of course, it's right for us to use it. I mean, these are words of scripture, and that's what we preach. Um, as to what the hearers might have heard, well, they would have understood the meaning of, because they, for the Jews, for example, they've lived through various kingdoms, right? Um, in the Old Testament, they have seen, I mean, this picture is in Daniel, from the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Grecians, the Romans, and then it comes saying that the kingdom of God, God's kingdom, the ultimate kingdom is at hand, which is also his kingdom, because you, you can search where it is called the kingdom of Christ as well. First of all, the kingdom of God is God's rule. It is God's rule. And that rule is, Christ would say that it is in our hearts. What, is, what does that mean? So it's a present reign awaiting final consummation. Is God ruling now? Yes, he is. He is reigning now. 
but the consummation is not yet. We call it, you, you hear phrases like already and not yet. So it's presently raining, and then when the second advent takes place, that will be fully consummated. So we should proclaim that kingdom, proclaim the reign of Christ. A king rules, kingdom, king domain, the sphere over which a king exercises his rule. That's the kingdom of God. And where is that sphere? It is all of life. It is the whole world that he exercises his domain. But remember that you also have that competing kingdom even at the same time. There's the kingdom of man, there's the kingdom of God. And um, we are, I think Colossians 1, 12 helps understand, uh, help explain where he speaks about our translation from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, which is the kingdom of light. So we have that crossover, that transition that has been made when we are saved. The question is, what is the expression of living in the kingdom of God? Now, I do agree that, well, like, let me not say I do agree. I, I don't fool everybody when they evangelize, but I, I imagine that people do not walk up to persons and they say, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. They try to explain, maybe not using the exact phrase. But to the extent that they understand what that means, then they are correct. But should the phrase be employed? Of course, it should be employed as far as we can explain what it means. Um, to, to the people because the king will return and he will exact vengeance on his enemies and then crown his own people with, with the blessings that he has promised. Um, I don't know that that helps. <laughs> 60. Well, at least that's, that's pass. It's not, <laughs> it's not distinction. Yeah, I mean, we can elaborate on that more. Maybe we'll do that in the course of this, just to elaborate on that more. We can. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so just to further buttress what you're saying, if you just go up to someone and say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, they are not expecting any kingdom. Okay? The Jews were expecting that, which is what you explained. So if you go about just telling people the kingdom of God is at hand in the morning with your microphone and you say it throughout the streets, no one will come to saving faith in Christ. They will not understand that gospel. And even Paul elaborated and when he talked about his own gospel he said it's Christ and him crucified he explained what he did in all those his mission trips yeah yeah thank you yeah courage Is that what? this question has been asked okay any other <laughs> Uh, you tell him afterwards. It's not. It's, a, it's a response to him. I'm the, if you want to speak, to ask me. You ask me. If you want to respond to him, you do that afterwards. What do you say? And when he tells you, you not, when he tells when he tells when he tells you, you tell them. <laughs> All right. If there are no questions, please just remember. I mean, we said at the beginning, last Lord's Day, that the intention of this is that our hearts may be stirred to actually be exercised exercise in evangelism and hopefully in the course of this we would see we will get to the practicalities as to how we ought to be doing this um, but we should be evangelizing that much is clear for Christians here we were saved by the gospel we're saved by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and some of us is through books some of us were preached to and we should proclaim it Romans 10, Romans 9, Romans 10, the picture of Paul there is, I think it's, it's, a, it's an important picture for us to see how a man may be burdened for the lost and what he then does about it. He prays and then he faithfully proclaims the gospel. But that's what we can do. That's what we ought to do. Uh, we can't save, but we should certainly be faithful in proclaiming the gospel. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would... You would stir our hearts by your spirit and grant that we may obey the command to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, to set forth Christ as the only mediator between God and man. Please, Lord, grant this, we pray, and grant that the harvest, your own harvest, into your own barnyard will be brought from the teeming masses of people to whom we hope to reach. We thank you asking this things in Christ's name. Amen.